Well, listening to all that, Gavin Shuka, the Labour MP for Luton South, and Joe Churchill, the new Conservative MP for Bury St Edmunds. Gavin Shuka, I, I mean, yours is an urban constituency, so presumably people in your constituency don't have any feelings about this. Well, people, are, by and large, are quite positive, and the statistics you gave to Chris Hitton Harris just then backed up. My issue with Chris, if I'm honest, is he's entitled to his opinions, but not entitled to his own facts. And the facts are this, 19,000 jobs depend on this technology and there's been no major energy revolution that's happened without government support, whether that's nuclear, oil and gas in the North Sea or now renewables. We've got to face up to the big challenge, which is decarbonising our energy supply. And if we're going to do that, we need a better policy on planning than this one. But it's easier for you to have that view in an, in an urban constituency. Look, I understand the political pressures on a, someone like Chris Heaton Harris uh, from his residents who don't necessarily want to see this go ahead. I would just say there is a silent minority through majority, though, uh, that support this technology, perhaps even in some of the places where it's most opposed. And so we need to have a balanced approach to it. Joe Churchill, you don't have too many wind farms in Suffolk, no. but where do you stand on this? Basically, I would, I would largely agree with Chris. It's about giving local people the choice, and it's also about us adhering to what we made pledges to do in the manifesto, and that's what we're driving forward. But I would say, I mean, Suffolk's just about to have the largest offshore wind farm, um, and those jobs are actually going to supply work further up the East Coast in the Siemens factory. So it's, it's not all a negative story. But the industry say if we don't have them onshore, mm -hmm. that's going to affect offshore because it, actually they make more profit from onshore. Indeed, but the evidence, where's the evidence that it will do away with the offshore industry? They say and, it. Okay, fine, but if you like, any business will make their case for it. Now, we're not saying that you can't have community projects and so on going on, but this is about local people having a local say over their environments and what's right for them. And it, it's right that we start to drive through what we've, what we've pledged to people in the manifesto. But what if the, that local opinion affects us all as mm -hmm. a country because of climate change? Right, but we need a mixed approach to um, going forward to what we have. If, some of the statistics that were banded around then were about how reliable wind is. Now, 142 in Northamptonshire sites, one of the least windy areas. You want to have appropriate, um, appropriate industries in appropriate places. Tidal, a huge success in Swansea Bay. You've got nuclear. We need a mixed approach. We need to use renewables. And there are incidences where wind hasn't provided enough electricity abroad and they've actually had to revert back to using gas turbine. Well, that's actually not very sensible either. He's, he's nodding. I mean, have we got agreement here straight away? Uh, yeah, although I, I just felt that Joe was probably arguing against her own government's position in this place. You're absolutely right. We do need appropriate planning and proper planning about where these sites go ahead. The key issue here, however, is uh, the more you push this decision back down to the hands um, of local communities, it's very often the loudest voices that win out and not necessarily the loudest voices across the whole country. We've already heard about the support for this technology. We do need to deliver on it. OK, we'll, we'll move on to our next subject. A question close to all our hearts. How much should we be paid? This autumn, the minimum wage will rise by 20 pence to £6.70 an hour. The subject of the minimum wage came up in Parliament this week and Business Minister Anna Soubry had this to say about employers. Well, could, could I just remind the Honourable Lady that of course the minimum wage will be going up in October but it's up to employers to make sure that they pay the wages that they seek to, to and want to do. But can our businesses afford it? We've been to a restaurant in Newton Flotman just south of Norwich to find out. For us as a business, rough calculation that I did, we would be looking at having to find another £300 a week, and that's being relatively conservative, to be honest. Um, and £300 a week is either another full-time member of staff, perhaps, or, you know, it, it's another chunk of money that we've got to find and probably have to knock on to our customers. The Saturday night is where the core of our business comes from. That pays for our fixed costs, for example, our mortgage. Um, and then we have obviously overheads of salaries to pay so that we would that Friday night would pay for that Sunday nights um, would then pay for utilities and food costs and then we would hope that the Tuesday Wednesday and Thursdays would give us that buffer in our business that you know that we need to hopefully make a profit 
let the businesses work out what's affordable for them. That, that guarantees job security. There's no point in putting pressure onto us to ensure that we're paying what they feel is, is right for us to pay our staff. Let us be fair employers. The staff can always go on to find other positions that pay better if that's what they feel, but let us make sure that our business remains secure and jobs remain secure. What they need to realise is all of, the, all of us small businesses then that have to take that knock-on um, increase are going to have to find that money from somewhere. So as a business, if we can bring our fixed costs down, to, then we can use that money to be able to, to give to our staff. For example, they might wish to decrease VAT, for instance, perhaps business rates. They're the kind of things that you know are fixed costs to us and employers. And if you could see that percentage come down, all of a sudden your business has got more money on the bottom line. And let's face it, if, we can, if we've got more money on the bottom line, jobs are secure. And also we can give that money to our staff and they're going to be happier. So that's a restaurant that's paying above the minimum wage very often, but she's worried about paying the living wage. The TU say says one in five jobs pays below the living wage of £7.85, and they believe that figure should actually be £10 an hour. Theresa Mackay is the chair of the East of England Trades Union Network. At the end of the day, the national minimum wage isn't even a living wage, and in today's society, I think we would expect employers to be able to pay a living wage. At the moment, what is happening to those employers that don't uh, pay a living wage, uh, we, the taxpayers, are subsidising them heavily through working tax credits and other benefits. So I think that's an argument. The government are cutting back on benefits, whereas at the same time, people who are on benefits and being subsidised by the taxpayer uh, will be losing out when their employers are not paying them enough for them to live on. What do you say to this argument that actually by having a higher minimum wage you take out the differential you pay, you pay more to staff who've been there a while and who are loyal and less to those people who join? If the minimum wage goes up then you won't get that differential. In east, the east of England, since 2010, uh, the average loss in pay is around about £2,300. So we have had a stalemate in wages being stuck. Uh, one of the other problems with this is that if, if, say, the restaurant pays an extra amount to each person it has on its books, then the supplier pays an extra amount to them, and then their suppliers pay an extra amount to them. And before you know it, the cost of in this case a meal goes up dramatically and customers stay away well I'm sure it wouldn't go up dramatically I I can't see that giving employees uh, a living wage which in actual fact is just around uh, just over a pound an hour more will have that impact that could I'm sure could soon be um, built into the uh, finances of the company I can't see that the, uh, the whole place will go to the wall just because of that and uh, part of the East of England Trade Union Network is actually to call for a £10 uh, living wage. So that is, we feel, is what people need to live on. Theresa Mackay, thank you very much. OK, thank you. Joe Churchill, £10. Mm. Is that reasonable? No. Why not? People need to live. Absolutely people need to live. But the best thing you can do for people is to keep them in work. Now, £6.50, we're seeing the biggest rise because we are now beginning to see the fruits of the last five years where we have begun to cope with some of the problems that we inherited. What you have is you have the biggest rise in the, in the, in the minimum wage to £6.70. Now, if you like, if you were saying £6.50 to £7.85, that's a 20% uplift. It's quite glib to say, oh, well, companies can afford it. Until... I came into politics, I was running a small business. It is tough. It has been very tough. You can't magic money. Now, but if you, you make... if you pay people poorly, mm -hmm. uh, they will then get benefit. So the government is subsidising one way or another, isn't it? Yes, but you need jobs. We need high-skilled, high-quality jobs. You can only get that by business confidence and driving things through. You made a very good point about differentials as well within within... A t a work uh, within workers pay schemes you have to build these things in to encourage aspiration to reward training apprenticeships and so on Gavin Shuker with the uh, take the view that 
Uh, people are there to serve the economy. I take the different view. I think the economy is there to serve people. And actually, I don't begrudge anyone that wants to be able to go out, work a decent job, and come home with enough to support their family. That should be the starting point. I think we need a higher minimum wage. I think we need uh, the Where living wage rolled out. What, what? Well, we obviously had a plan to bring it up to £8 an hour over the course of this parliament. I'd have gone further personally. Um, we'll see where we get to. But bear in mind, this is a minimum wage that was put in place by Labour government when the Tories voted against it. People are reverting back to type in this discussion. Uh, I think fundamentally, yeah, the, for those uh, that are in, the lowest in, incomes, in fairness, they need to have security. The Labour government who introduced it didn't get near to the living wage. Yeah. They, they had a minimum wage which was well below the living wage. Well, that's, well, we took measures to increase it over time. But the work, reason why I got there is because we actually have a panel which is made up of employers, employees, trades unions and government to determine what that rate should be. We think you should put your foot in the accelerator, not least of all because you're absolutely right. The government at the moment is subsidising poor employment practices that cost us all when actually the likes of Tesco's, care agencies and others should be paying an appropriate level of pay to their employees. And I'm sorry, if that costs a bit more, then we're all going to pay a little bit more. Just very quickly, Jo Churchill, she yes. said you should cut the business rate and VAT. Are they going to do that? They're not, are they? No, I shouldn't think so. But actually what we need to do, and I fully take on board your point uh, about what happened historically, but this increase in the minimum wage is the largest one since 2008 and we can do that because we are beginning to see how well the economy is doing now if you like as i said you cannot magic money well the local okay. commission said it just to say all right not George Osborne. let's move on shall we uh, maiden speeches and labor leadership contenders are in our 60 seconds roundup this week here's deborah mcgurran Labour's leadership campaign hit the region this week. Andy Burnham explained that it was after seeing the Tories win Basildon in 1992 that he decided to become a politician. That's where I kind of made a career choice and wanted to commit myself uh, to politics. Uh, so Basildon does hold a, a special place uh, in my heart. Clacton MP Douglas Carswell's complaint to David Cameron that social employment law was not part of the EU negotiations prompted a quip from the PM. He's, uh, he's made some history because uh, as, as a party of one, he's managed to have a backbench rebellion, which is... Um... <laughs> South East Cambridge's new MP Lucy Fraser joked about enslaving the Scots. There's an answer to the West Lothian question. <laughs> And Norwich's Clive Lewis was keen to distance himself from the town's namesake. For those of you that haven't had the pleasure of visiting the fine city of Norwich, let me assure you it's far more than simply the home of Adam Partridge and Radio Norwich. Gavin Shuka, who are you backing? Clive Lewis. <laughs> I'm leader. sitting right behind him. <laughs> yes. No, in the leadership. Uh, I'm backing Liz Kendall. I think um, we need someone that understands you've got to push power downwards. The state isn't the answer to every problem, but it needs to be strong. And most of all, I'm after the candidate that the Tories are most concerned about um, facing down across the dispatch box. So I hope that argument will get across. Uh, we're sometimes slow learners in the Labour Party, but I hope that we get there faster. Did, was there a, a point where somebody should have said that you could have learned from the Conservative Party under Michael Howard that you waited until you had somebody that you... I think, I think I've already said that, um, you know, my preference would have been that Ed Miliband would have stayed on for much longer. I'd, I would have been the last guy in the bunker, Fred. I love Ed, I think it's great. Um, but that would have helped the party as well. Um, the reality is, though, we're going to have to do a four-month uh, leadership campaign and all of the candidates will know this time next week uh, who is in and who is not. Uh, I've got the chance now to go out and state their case. And it's not just Labour Party members that are deciding, it's ordinary members of the public as well if they pay £3 and support our aims, which I think is a big step forward. So Conservatives could do that. They could pay their £3 and get the leader they want, couldn't yeah, they? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. We could put that, chuck our £3 in. But if you like, I fully agree. I think it would have been better for you had Ed stayed in place and, and there would, had been a little more solidity. I mean, if you like, you were lucky that the person who's been able to step up had got, she'd got prior experience. Yeah, great. She, yeah. And she'll, she'll do this really, really well. But, um, you know, it's tough for all parties when we face this kind of experience. Mm. And on a human level... Who can blame Ed Miliband for no. wanting to Absolutely. walk away from and the drama that he got? It was great to see him back, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Listen, both of you, thank you very much for being here. Have you got over the general election? I've had a tough month, I'm not going to lie. I was pleased to increase my majority, but uh, very, very sad that the next five years will be a repeat of the last. Listen, thank you both of you very much.